Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's class. Um, I'm a few days late here. I was just got back from uh, Australia. Yesterday, I'm off to um, to Tokyo tomorrow, sort of my last little bit, and I'm uh, um, free for about a month, which is good. I'm very, very happy to have the time off. So I was supposed to do the class just, it's... Um, I guess Wednesday today is supposed to have it done just the last few days, but just been so overtired with all the flying. This is my uh, did about five trips in a row to Korea, Japan, and Australia. So um, I'm a little bit. This is my day off, so I have a little bit uh, more of a rest, which was good, and I can think a little clearer. I was kind of worried about doing a class in Australia that I do it and then you know look at it again and just be completely um, so overtired and jet lag that none of it, none of anything I was saying would make sense. So hopefully this is a little bit better. <clears throat> so welcome to uh, class today. Uh, this particular one is the second last class of our course on uh, Pramana or Valid Cognition. And this in particular is a class on the Wheel of Life or the 12 Dependent Related Links, which is a, um, Big topic in Buddhism, there's a lot in Abhidharma and in uh, a lot of sutras. In Lam Rim, it's uh, the three scopes of Lam Rim from the Glupa tradition, uh, Lama Tsongkhapa and uh, Tisha's works. Um, the 12 dependent related links are in the intermediate scope of Lam Rim. If the lower scope is about really finding refuge, understanding karma, the intermediate scope is how, based on that understanding how to actually stop your suffering, true sufferings. So uh, you sort of get the, all the um, Four Noble Truths are your truths all sort of in one between the initial and intermediate scope. You get sort of introduced to true uh, uh, sufferings and uh, true origins in the uh, first uh, initial scope. But in the intermediate scope of Lam Rim, you get true cessations and true paths. So the three higher trainings of uh, moral discipline, um, concentration, wisdom, realizing emptiness are presented. So you actually get that part of the book when you really do it it gives you the whole recipe of how to get enlightened um in in your life just basically how to achieve our hathood or to reach uh, full awakening by having direct realization of emptiness based on a mind of tranquil abiding uh, which is based on uh, sila or correct moral discipline or discipline mind uh, knowing what to adopt and what to abandon then you have sort of the valid cognition and true cognition of ultimate truth, of seeing the uh, ultimate truth of conventional truth, so to speak, or seeing the emptiness of all dependent uh, related uh, things. So uh, today we're going to talk about this, the wheel of life. I'll go a little bit, a uh, little bit more detail just on this. This is the famous uh, tanka that it probably or picture or painting that a lot of people have seen. Um, uh, just whatever in, in Tibetan Tonkas or at monasteries, they visit this or that, or even at uh, um, yeah, sort of uh, art museums or whatever else. Very, very famous, very, very beautiful. I remember when I first start, started in Buddhism being really uh, struck by this. It just seemed uh, such a beautiful uh, teaching and beautiful painting and just uh, very, very cosmic. So uh, just really, really beautiful. So we'll go into a little bit detail about what this is and the meaning of it today and just how it relates in particular to valid uh, cognition of uh, wisdom realizing emptiness. Okay, so let's just um, take a moment uh, to sort of get ready here. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna have to make my phone on silent in case people are texting me there. So, uh, and let's just take a moment to do the Heart Sutra. <clears throat> Essence of perfection wisdom, the Blessed Mother. Homage to perfection wisdom, Blessed Mother. Thus I've heard at one time, Blessed One was dwelling in Raj Greer, and mass vultures bound together the great assembly of monks and a great assembly of bodhisattvas. That time, Blessed One was absorbed in the concentration of countless aspects of phenomena called profound illumination. That time, also, Superior of Alokshvara, the Bodhisattva, the great being, was looking perfectly at the price of the profound perfection wisdom, looking perfectly at the emptiness of inherent existence and also the five aggregates. Then to the power of Buddha, Venerable Sharaputra said to Superior of Alokshvara, the Bodhisattva, the great being, how should a son uh, of the lineage train who wishes to engage in the practice of the profound perfection of wisdom? Thus he spoke, and Spirit of Alakshvara, the Bodhisattva, the great being, replied to Venerable Shariputra as follows. Shariputra, whatever son or daughter of the lineage wishes to engage in the practice of the profound perfection of wisdom should look perfectly like this. Subsequently, looking perfectly and correctly at the emptiness of inherent existence and also five aggregates, form is empty and emptiness is form. Emptiness is none other than form, and form is none other than emptiness. Likewise, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Should I put you like this all phenomena merely empty, having no characteristics? They're not produced and do not cease. They have no defilement and no separation from defilement. They have no decrease and no increase. 
Therefore, Sherry Putrin, emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, and no consciousness. There is no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no form, no sound, no smell, no taste, no touch, object, no phenomenon. There is no eye element, and so forth, up to no mind element, and also up to no element of no consciousness. There is no ignorance, and no exhaustion of ignorance, and so forth, up to no aging and death, and no exhaustion of aging and death. Likewise, no suffering, origin, cessation, or path, no exalted wisdom, no attainment, also no non attainment. Therefore, Sherpa, because there is no attainment, body suffers rely on and abide in the perfection of wisdom. The minds have no obstructions and no fear, passing on and beyond perversity, they attain the final nirvana. Also, all Buddhas reside perfectly in the three times having relied upon the perfection of wisdom, became manifest, complete Buddhas, in the state of unsurpassed, perfect, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, and surpassed mantra, the equal, the unequal mantra, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, since it's not all, should be known as the truth. Mantra perfection of wisdom is proclaimed, Tayata, Om Gata Gata Paragata Par, Samgari Bodhisoha. Should I put your body sap by great beings should train the profound perfection wisdom like this? Then the Blessed One arose from that concentration and said, Spirit Bhattashwara, the body sap of the great being that had spoken well. Good, good, Osanalin, just like that. Since it's like that, just as you have revealed, in that way, the profound perfection wisdom should be practiced, and the Tathagas will also rejoice. The Blessed One and said this, Venerable Shariputra, Spirit of Avalokiteshvara, the body of the great being, and the entire circle of disciples, as well as worldly beings, gods, humans, demigods, and spirits, were delighted and highly praised what had been spoken by the Blessed One. Let's take a moment just to chant uh, the Gati Mantra, <clears throat> just seven times through. Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha Om Gate Gate Para Gate Para Sam Gate Bodhisoha Maybe just a short meditation in Gina, Sarah. Okay, for our visualization today for Ganima Gema. We just make ourselves comfortable here. And um, Sit comfortably with a straight back and let's start to visualize ourselves seated in a wide open space. Ground like beautiful, beautiful lapis lazuli. And ourselves all surrounded by all sentient beings from all six realms of cyclic existence. Those closest to us sort of moving up in concentric circles to those for uh, sort of more unrelated to us, so to speak, or you know, that we don't know. So starting with the people closest humans, uh, our mother on our left, our father on our right, people we love the most behind us as support, and people we like the least in front of us as objects of our prayers uh, and practice and compassion. People from all over, uh, all our other relations, uh, where we live, our work, and so forth, our country, moving out to around the world, all people from different backgrounds, countries, and places, all here included without exception. Countless beings from the animal realm, from the sky, the earth, and the sea. Countless beings from the spirit realm, spirit world, uh, from very, very small to very large spirits. All beings in the ethereal, astral realms, elemental planes, and so forth are all here with us. 
celestial beings from this higher uh, form and formless realms, different gods and goddesses and so forth. And the vast majority of beings here, just a bigger number, just sort of further away from us here, just beings in from lower states of rebirth, the hungry ghost realms and the hell realms. And for Helms, you can think of uh, hot hells, cold hells, neighboring hells, resembling hells, so forth. So the whole sentient being family is kind of here with us, just all sort of interconnected, all of us here uh, practicing together. Everybody's kind of happy, at peace. So I'm very pleased to be practicing Dharma together. And for ourselves, let's visualize the uh, pure land of Tashida, or Gandan pure land, land of joy, sort of countless devas, uh, of sort of the, I guess sort of the divinities of this pure land of great bliss. It is the pure land of the universal Buddhas who descend and teach Buddhism. In this case, pure land of Shakyamuni Buddha and um, Buddha Maitreya, the future Buddha of love and kindness as well as the Buddha of uh, Wisdom, Manjushri, that's uh, his pure land as well. So in this beautiful land, where you just see a nice little town and in it's a cathedral, and the doors are open and we can look in, and in it is the future fifth universal Buddha, of this fortune and Neon, Buddha of loving kindness, Maitreya, seated on a throne, like uh, just like a king, in select the chair, sort of rather than sitting in lotus position on the ground or a little lotus seat or whatever, he's in a chair showing that he's kind of going to get up and uh, sort of descend into this world as the next Buddha to teach a new doctrine of Buddhism in the near future based on love and uh, loving kindness and compassion and so forth. So he has a golden energy body, wearing a crown, silks. His hands are in the turn of the wheel of Dharma Mudra, and he's holding two white lotuses. On his right is a great uh, Buddhist uh, saint and master, Atisha, Deepampakara Vinjana, is from um, West Bengal, and he's in Three Robes of the Monk, uh, representing the old Kadampa tradition of the Sarma, or second uh, wave of translations into Tibet from India. And he, again, he's got his hands in the turn of the wheel of Dharma as well. And on the other side, our right, or Maitreya's left, is founder of the new Kadampa tradition, our tradition, a great saint, Lama Tsongkhapa. And he's in the way we usually visualize in lotus position with um, three robes of a uh, monk. And his hands are in the turn of the wheel of Dharma Mudra, uh, the two white lotuses. So now at their at Maitreya's heart, so just sort of showing the continuity from Buddha Maitreya's teachings, all the teachings of the universal Buddha's Buddha, uh, of Buddhism into all the great sort of lineage masters in India and uh, sort of culminating in this sort of um, lineage being passed on or tradition being passed on into Tibet in the 11th century, figure of Atisha, and now uh, uh, again being revitalized in the 1400s, Lama Sangatha, and then being brought down to the current day all the great Kalupa masters that have come from uh, India to teach our own teachers, like Princess Azab Tukul Rinpoche, Solinus the Dalai Lama, for instance, all these great lamas teaching us. And then we sort of wanting to be uh, our own uh, sort of Kanampa practitioners um, here in uh, Western countries in the 21st century. So at Maitreya's heart now on this little sort of reflective, beautiful gold and um, uh, eternal lot, but it's eternal lot, made out of energy, all sorts of uh, beautiful white fluffy clouds, kind of like shaving cream or whipped cream start coming. And on it again is Jay Sumkap at this time with his two heart students, Chapagetso and Kedruche. And they're seated in front of him and each one of them is dressed in three robes of a monk and yellow pants hat. And they just have the teaching mudra with the right hand, uh, the index finger touching the thumb, and they have a little Dharma text in their lap. 
So at Jason Kappa's heart, uh, we're gonna visualize um, the Buddha of wisdom. He's mostly seen, he's seen as the manifestation of Buddha of wisdom, compassion, and power. So Manjushri, Lalakashvara, and Vajrapani respectively. But in particular, uh, they, they sort of, you know, sort of the tradition is to sort of see him in particular as a manifestation of Manjushri, Buddha of wisdom. So let's visualize Manjushri at his heart and uh, wearing uh, as a beautiful golden body, wearing silks, has a crown, he's in lotus position, he has a flaming sword held over his hips right hand. And uh, left hand is at his heart here and three uh, jewels mudra with a beautiful white lotus around his uh, left shoulder with the Prajna Paramita text, 100,000 lines. Now, um, on our left here, or Jason Kappa's right, is Gatsabje or uh, Jeppa Gatso, and he's seen as a manifestation of a bit of compassion of Alokshvara's, his beautiful white colored body in uh, lotus position, holding a jeweled, um, he has a crown also, a little antelope skin, like almost like a little cardigan and so forth, beautiful silks. He's holding the multicolored jewel at his heart, his first two hands, and the second hands here hold a um, left hand lotus and right hand a crystal mala representing uh, compassion. And then Kedrupche on the other side here, our right, or Jason Kappa's left, and he is uh, at his heart, he sees that manifestation of Buddha of power, Vajrapani. And Vajrapani is uh, his legs outstretched here, as the right slant, slightly bent, and he's on fire, sort of dark blue, blackish color. Uh, wearing a crown, he's super beautiful, and he has a little tiger skin loincloth, wearing some uh, multicolored, five colored uh, snakes. And he's holding a uh, threatening mudra up, a uh, golden dorji at his right hand, left hand is in the uh, threatening mudra at his heart, holding a lasso sort of to control, sort of tie up negative energy. So I'm doing this visualization as we do the prayer here for Ganilagema. Let's um, visualize that the lamas come closer to us to do uh, to give us their blessings and positive energy. So refuge, I take refuge in Buddha Dharma and Sangha until I attain enlightenment. By the merit accumulated from practicing generosity and other perfections, may I attain enlightenment or to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha until I attain enlightenment. By the merit accumulated from practicing generosity and other perfections, may I attain enlightenment or to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I attain enlightenment by the merit of kingdom from Christ and generosity and perfections. I attain enlightenment in order to benefit all sentient beings. And once in Tibetan, Sahange Chud Hang So Ke Chona Hang La Jan Chu Bar Du Dagi Kyam Su Chi Dagi Chin So Gi Pe Sona Hang Ki Dro la pan chi hir sangay dru pa May all beings have happiness in its causes. May all beings be free from suffering in their causes. May all beings consistently dwell in joy, transcending sorrow. May all beings dwell in equal love for both those close and distant. Inviting uh, the merit field, Lama Sankapit is two chief disciples for the practice of Genla Gema, hundreds of days of the joyful land. From the heart of the protected the hundreds of deities of the joyful land, beak of the clouds like a cluster of fresh white curd, all knowing Los Sangrapa, king of the Dharma, please come to this place together with your two chief disciples. In the space performing the lion's throne, lotus and moon, the venerable guru smiles delight. Supreme field of merit from my mind of faith, please remain for a hundred uh, aeons to spread the teachings. Your minds of wisdom realize the extent, uh, full extent of objects of knowledge. Your eloquent speech is ear ornament of the fortunate. Your beautiful bodies are ablaze with the glory of renown. I prostrate to you, whom to see, to hear, and to remember so meaningful. Pleasing water offerings, various flowers, sweet smelling incense, light scented water, and so forth, a vast god of offerings, both set out and imagined, and offered to the supreme field of merit. Whatever non virtues of body, speech, and mind have accumulated since time without beginning, especially transgressions of my three vows, with great remorse, I can declare each one from the depths of my heart. In this degenerate age, you so for much learning and accomplishment, abandon the eight worldly concerns you made your leisure and endowment meaningful. Protected from the very depths of my heart, I rejoice in the great weaving of deeds. 
From the billing clouds of wisdom and compassion, the space of your enlightened minds, venerable and holy gurus, please send down a rain of vast and profound dharma appropriate to the disciples of this world. May your vasha body, created from the purity of clear light, free the rising and setting of cyclic existence, but visible in the ordinary viewer only in some subtle physical form, stay on and changing until samsara ends. Through the virtues I've accumulated uh, here, may the teachings of all of you receive every benefit, especially the essence of the teachings of Lama J. Sankatha shine forever. Okay, so as we just recite just the invocation here in the seven uh, limb practice, we visualize that J. Sankatha and his two heart students sort of come closer to sort of little clouds coming from Maitreya's heart, start to descend. Like I say, it's like rolling out a yoga mat. They sort of come closer bringing uh, the three gurus just sort of before us, in particular, three Buddhas of Manjushri, uh, Valokashvara, and Vajrapani before us too. So we're getting sort of um, beautiful uh, energy empowerment from the Buddha of wisdom, Buddha of compassion, and the Buddha of power. So I'm offering a mandala from her heart here. This mandala is built from a base for spending with flowers, saffron, water, and incense. Adorned with Mount Meru, before lands, sun, and full moon, by offering this pure mandala to you, assembly, but as visualized here before me, may all living beings experience pure happiness and be reborn in pure lands. The objects of my desire, aversion, and ignorance, friend, enemy, and stranger, my body, and all possessions. These I offer without clinging for your enjoyment. Please bless me and all living beings to be released from the three poisonous minds. Om Madam Guru Radna Mandala Kamirti Yami. Send forth this jewel mandala to you, precious gurus. Okay, so as we recite the mantra here of uh, J. Sankapa, this visualize beautiful lights coming down. This time here, maybe we can visualize three colored lights of gold and light from J. Sankapa from the heart of Venture Beautiful white light from uh, uh, Valokiteshvara's heart at uh, Gyatsabje's heart. And uh, beautiful lapis colored blue light from Vajrapani's heart at Kedrupje's heart. So we're coming down. So, um, uh, I don't even know if they have it anymore, but there used to be that uh, uh, toothpaste, what was it, Aquafresh or so, I can't remember. And it's got like the three colors in it, red, white, and blue, but it's it's like you know, squeeze the tube and all three little colors come up together. I always say it's kind of like that, where you get like the three colors coming in sort of a single beam into your, into your crown, ascending in your heart, purifying you and uh, raising your energy level, giving you all sorts of virtue energy. So we can also feel that that light is being diffused outwards as well to all sentient beings around us to bless them as well. Make me say way to chen chen raisi. Dream me he can pay wang po jam pao yang. Do pu ma lu jom se he sang way da. Gan chen ke pe sing hung kian song ka pa. Lo zan dra pe he sha bla ha so wa de. Mig me se we te her chen chen raisi. Dream me kian pe he wang po ho chan pao yang. Do pung ma lu jong hong se sang we da. Gan chen ke pe he sun ke han song ka pa. Lo sa han dra pe sha ha bla so wang de. Mig me se we he te chen chen raisi. Gri me ken pe wang po jam pao yan. Du pu ma lu hu chom se he sang we ta. Gan chen ke pe sing hung kian song ka pa. Lo zang dra pe he sha bla so wa de. You are a Valakashvar, a great treasure of unimaginable compassion, a magistry master of flawless wisdom, and Bajapani, the lord of the secret and the story, holds the Mars that exception. Song Captain, Crown Jewel Sages Line of Snows, Lo Sing Dragon, I make request of your lotus feet. Short mantra. O oh my Guru Vajadar Samadakurti Siddhi Hum. O oh my Guru Vajadar Samadakurti Siddhi Hum. O oh my Guru Vajadar Samadakurti Siddhi Hum. Now I'm just visualizing at our heart um, after having done the uh, practice here. So come on a sec. 
having done the practice right here, uh, let's just visualize that our heart. Uh, wonderful. Um, we sort of have like hollow body. We have a um, little white eight um, petal white lotus at our heart with a white moon disc on top. So I'll say petal is just about the size of a quarter or so inside our heart chakra. It's in the middle of our central channel. It just goes up, crown of our head. So as we recite this, we're going to visualize, we can dissolve everything into uh, Jason Kappa, who then carbons down to our heart. Okay, so we're reciting these uh, verses. Glorious and precious root guru, please come to the lowest and then see of my crown. May your great kindness please remain with us and bestow upon me the blessings of your body, speech, and mind. Glorious and precious root guru, please ascend the lowest and seat of my heart. May your great kindness please remain with me and grant me the calm and supreme realizations. Glorious and precious root guru, please remain the lowest and seat of my heart. May your great kindness please remain with me. Please remain to achieve the essence of enlightenment. So upon saying that, we start to visualize that uh, to sheet of pure land starts to melt into a beautiful golden light, just like sunlight. All beautiful land, like the mountains and rivers and uh, seas and so forth, forests all melt into light, dissolving in the town, then into the big cathedral, then into Jason Kappa and Atisha, who melt into Maitreya. And then Maitreya, but is like a beautiful sun, beautiful ball of golden light. And he starts coming towards us in the sky, sort of uh, melting up all the clouds and dissolves into Jason Kappa. Now we can visualize that Japagat uh, Sankhya um, uh, with um, Avalokshvara and Vajrapani respectively, sort of melt into balls of golden light and dissolve into Jason Kappa. So now it's just him in the sky floating in a beautiful golden light. And he gets small, uh, about the size of a sunflower seed, and comes to the crown of our head. Sort of the embodiment of all the holy beings, all the light beings, in particular Buddha's uh, wisdom, compassion, power. And he enters our central channel, and slowly, just like a leaf falling, starts to descend. Until he sort of lands on the center of the moon disk at the center of the um, eight petal lotus at our hearts. And then that starts to close. Once it closes all the way up, there's two little golden mantras going around it, almost like string if you're tying a tulip bulb shut. And the lower string is uh, counterclockwise rotating. Magura Vajas Managurdi Sibi Hum, Jason Kappa's mantra. And clockwise turning on top of that golden Manjushri mantra, Amara Patsanadi. And we can just feel that just sort of closes up like a little amulet box. I mean, just starts to the energy is melting into our heart, just like that butter, melted butter. So Jason Kappa and Manjushri and all holy beings, all their energy is going directly into us. We can feel just great sense of spaciousness, sense of totality, bliss, peace, joy. Okay, it's coming out of meditation now. Okay, so this class uh, is on, again, the Wheel of Life, the 12 dependent related links and um, its relationship to uh, prominent or valid cognition in the context of the course that we're doing. So again, um, you've probably, people have seen the nice little um, picture of the Wheel of Life Tonka. Uh, Rinpoche, as Rinpoche said, that this was kind of like the first official Tonka or Buddhist art. That I, I don't know if it was King Indrabudi or King, uh, one of um, Buddha's uh, sort of patrons and students. I, I think it, anyway, I can't remember. You'd have to look the story up, but I think it's uh, maybe this uh, other king 
asked for a teaching from Buddha, maybe to uh, the King Indrabudi, who asked the Buddha um, to give a teaching. And so he said, well, I'm gonna commission kind of all my teachings into one picture, kind of like one metaphor almost, so to speak. And that th th I'll get this painted and then you can give it to him. Uh, I think that's how it works. Or maybe Buddha directly gave it to him, sent it off. And so when the king, uh, with a little commentary, of course, you get something like this, you don't know what it is, but it's a, a little commentary that he got from it, a little booklet or something. And then when he was able to read it and study it and then like understanding the whole meaning of this, it's like a recipe. Uh, when he started meditating on this, he, he uh, realized emptiness and became an arhat and was liberated and became one of Buddha's, uh, of course, arhat students, which is really, really good. So this is uh, just to give a little bit of an explanation we go into the details uh, with this. Uh, basically you could say the whole um, sort of path uh, is in this one picture, which is amazing. So it is kind of like, you know, before the, the age of computers or anything sort of fancy like that, you've got like a little zip file or like a little app on your computer, all, you know, whether it's Spotify, all your music or whatever. Here we have all the teachings in one picture that's for the most part fairly easy uh, to understand. Uh, it's not like super, super cryptic uh, or magical or mysterious uh, once you get the commentary to it. Uh, so it, there is a little bit of artistic license uh, when you see this. Sometimes there's, there's differences in the presentation or whatever. But for the most part, when, when you see it, this one's from uh, Wisdom Books, um, they're all kind of pretty similar. So the first thing that you can see is that, you know, there's a uh, wheel here, wheel of life, and it's being held by this monster. So this is uh, just culturally uh, Yama, who in, in Asian culture, basically from India all the way over to Japan and even into Siberia and then downwards, um, probably into old Indonesian culture. This is kind of like a, an archetypal figure that you get. And he is kind of, I guess, kind of like Hades or ruler of hell, ruler of the underworld, this or that. But he also doubles as being like a figure representing death itself. So uh, like uh, the Grim Reaper, for instance. And so the, um, speaking of sentient beings, got a little moth there going around, wants to listen to the teachings. So um, uh, how many pay me home, how many pay me home? So this is why they have like the, the for instance, the uh, central uh, Buddhist deity, Yamantaka, terrifier, destroyer of death, terminator of death, looks like Yama. Yama's usually, this one, a little bit different, but a lot of times so all, he's also known as uh, Kalarupa or Dharma Raja, king of the uh, Dharma, of, of the law, the law of karma, whatever law of rewards and punishment, whatever you have. And they'll often have him in India, sort of Indian style, like being having a big buffalo head and looking very, very scary. And, um, and he's in you know the lower realm, I guess you could say hell. Like when we use the term hells, it, it has more of a um, Judeo-Christian connotation of being a place where you know, there's a devil and that you get reborn there for all eternity. Of course, Asian hell is not really like that. It's probably closer to sort of the Greek or Roman idea of Hades, sort of like an underworld, right? But nonetheless, you know, in the way the stories go, like when you die and take rebirth in hell, you're brought before Yama here. And what he does is they, he's got like a little um, sort of an old kind of indigenous or shamanic um, board with black and white um, che checks on, like a little sums like a chessboard or something, sort of mapping out your karma, your good deeds and bad deeds, kind of like, well, why were you sent here? Well, we know you're sent here because you're a bad person or whatever. You've created so much negative karma. But the unlike let's say more of a Judeo-Christian concept or whatever was interesting here is um, that the punishments enacted by yourself, all Yama does is hold up a mirror and you see your own reflection and that's the punishment. You kind of create your own karma or you see that the karma being acted to you has been self-created or self-afflicted. Again, like the big illusion, like a nightmare you can't wake up from. But the fact is, is that it is illusory in its reality, just like everything else. So it's quite beautiful. Even that is a teaching of how you're quote unquote punished in hell. So you are punished by yourself, by your own karma. And the Denzians of hell you see in all the old uh, Asian uh, tankas and paintings of the animal headed monsters and they're running around like guys and they're you know whatever hitting you over the head of the club or uh, roasting you in a hot spit or something like this all this sort of classic medieval um, torture scenes these beings are just 
basic projections of your mind, kind of like, I don't say fictitious, but I guess you could kind of say that they aren't sentient beings. Otherwise, they would never be able to get enlightened, which means that their mind wouldn't be empty because it's not changeable and blah, blah, blah. So they're really seen in Buddhist cosmology as just being, uh, I, I guess, um, you know, agents of karma or something, projections of your own mind as a way of meeting out the punishment you receive from your own karma. So anyway, that, that's kind of how it is. So Yama, so what we have here is a similar thing. He's holding a mirror and you're seeing your reflection here. This is your reflection. What this is, is samsara itself. So you want to know um, the Lord of death, the Lord of hell, uh, death itself, the grim reaper is showing you a mirror. And what do you see in it? Well, you see yourself. You see the state that you're in, the condition that you're in, the, in this case, the human condition, but you know, uh, any sentient being would see its own condition, again, of the uh, aria truths of true sufferings and true origins, okay? So there's different rings here. The first sort of ring going clockwise here from the top around is the ring of the 12 dependent related links. So these causal links uh, have the, the production, it's a productive ring of uh, causal links that produce or have the effect of what they create as samsara. So they're all interconnected, they all rise together, they're all kind of simultaneous and interconnects a whole sort of interconnected web of these causes that produce the effect of the condition that you find yourself in, your own samsara to your true sort of worldly samsaric reflection is because of these 12 dependent related links. And it, you can, I won't be able to go into too much detail today because it's, you know, you could do, you could do years and years of study or whole co courses on this, but the ones being is that they're sort of run them in a ring, but they like a snake biting its tail, the final um, sort of results end up even causally bringing about another cycle. So it's basically, you know, uh, Sam is like a water wheel, wheel or a uh, Ferris wheel or whatever is always going around and around wheel of rebirth, wheel of life, right? So there's ignorance, uh, compositional actions, consciousness, uh, name and form, six sources, contact, um, feeling, craving, attachment, birth, uh, no, existence, birth, death, uh, yeah, birth and death, old, old age, suffering and death, you could say. So yeah, existence, birth, old age with its attendant uh, sufferings, and then death, and then it restarts again with um, ignorance. So the outer ring, there's different artistic expressions of it, but ignorance is shown as a blind person, you know, trying to, you know, to find their way walking around blind. Um, compositional actions, karmic actions, uh, is a potter making pottery. So creating things, there's a sense of, uh, you know, out of a raw material, creating functional things, right? Uh, consciousness is, they usually show it, uh, it's hard to see, this is so small, my eyes are so shot, um, but, um, the either you should have is a monkey, the monkey mind that we all have. It's a very worldly sort of attached mind. And they usually have the monkey sort of running around in the tree. So it's kind of funny that, you know, right off the bat, <laughs> not a very uh, positive depiction of our minds, like right up, you know, so out of our, the ignorance, that's sort of the primordial cause of samsara, things are becoming manifest or created through our compositional actions or karma we end up having the habitual mind that we do. And what's it like? Well, it's like, it's like the monkey mind. Name and form, they usually have it with a fairy man, uh, like a guy at the boat with passengers. And that represents um, basically name and form your five aggregates. Again, a form, discrimination, uh, consciousness, uh, feeling, and other uh, mental factors, secondary mental factors, or what they call compositional factors. And so name and form, so basically that the label on the base that creates a sense of self. You have a sense of an I imputed on these five aggregates, hence name and form. Six sources, which is those are from that, your body, mind, organic body complex come your six consciousnesses, which are the sense consciousnesses, of course. So five senses, uh, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, uh, body sensation, like feeling touch, as well as the six consciousness of your mental consciousness, your imagination, your imaging, and so forth. Um, so that's always represented as a house with six windows or a little door in it. Basically, like those are the doorways to the world that you end up living in. Um, next one is contact. If you have 
a body and mind. If your mind is embodied, necessarily by definition, definition of mind is uh, object possessor. And for, for Buddhism, we always say mind, of course, is clear and cognizing, but also mind is intentional in a phenomenological sense. In other words, mind is in relationship to something else, relationship to objects, even relationship to itself or whatever, but mind is in relationship. This is shown by contact. And this will often be, again, it's so small, but um, usually it'll be a couple making love. So it's kind of interesting. There's this idea of intimacy that we have with the world by being embodied. Uh, the world is one with us and uh, we're one with the world with our mind being intentional or in relatedness to other things, right? It's uh, situated or whatever. And that's why uh, if you're ever interested in reading, for instance, Merleau-Ponty's famous phenomenology of the body, famous French philosopher of the 20th century, he always says that to be embodied is the world itself is in your body and your body's in the world. They go together, the body-mind complex in the world. So he calls it reversibility or the chiasm is that whenever I see an object, I also, the object's looking back at me because I see the ways in which my body can be in relationship to it. My mind can be in relationship to it. So in other words, without objects, you'll get mind, without mind, you'll get objects. So it's intimate and embody just like a couple making love. Next one here is uh, feeling. And it's interesting, it's, they usually have a guy with an arrow in his eye. So it's quite a violent metaphor, but it's this idea of uh, the world being uh, in and out, like uh, us being part of the world, world being part of us. There's a sense of boundaries already being transgressed in the sense that, you know, everything's in you, you know, so it's feelings are sharp. Uh, even positive feelings, like they're, they're passionate in the, the Latin sense or medieval sense. Passion in Latin means to suffer, like in a sense to like to suffer a blow or wax, suffering a stamp. So there's this idea of feeling like, uh, you know, good and bad feelings or even neutral feelings. It's an impact on your body and mind relationship to the world. So we're talking about good impacts here or, you know, good feelings that we like. Then comes craving. And it's usually a guy drinking beer. I guess shown like an alcoholic sort of the, the first stirrings of our more sort of addictive mind where we have feelings, which means we want good things. We want to feel good and we don't want to feel bad. We want to run towards the things in a worldly refuge way, give us solace, happiness, peace, whatever. And we want to run away from things that give us pain worldly way. So based on that, you have attachment. So in other words, from contact, to objects, to feeling, to craving, that's sort of the addictive thing, to attachment. And of course, attachment, as my dear friend and teacher, uh, David Gonzalez, who say Los Angeles, he said, it's easy to test whether you're attached to something. How do you feel when it's taken from you? So like, let's say I'm very attached to my watch here. Friend gave this to me years ago. I do like it, 24 hour watch, I use that work. What happens if I drop it and it smashes and gets wrecked or whatever, it falls off my hand and into the river and I lose it forever. How do I feel? If I'm attached to it, it's a huge issue. I feel, oh my God, I got to get a new one. I can't believe that happened. Eh. Uh, if I'm not attached to it, it's like, oh, well, you know, easy come, easy go. You know, I just lost my watch. So, you know, there's attachment and aversion. It's, you know, that uh, it's not just things we like, but also we don't want to be around things we don't like. So in the old days, uh, Arthur Schopenhauer, our famous philosopher, said, if you really want to know what you, what you think of somebody, whether you really like them or really don't like them, when you open the door in the morning, there's a letter from them on the porch. How do you feel when you see the letter? So it'd be the same thing if you get a text or an email from someone you really, really like or someone you really don't like right away, you know, right? And it's a, a similar kind of thing. There's this whole visceral reaction one way or another. So that's how to test your... Um, attachment. So again, the monkey is back. So monkey's here on link number three. Now monkey's here back on link number nine out of 12. And they usually have the monkey reaching up to get uh, a uh, fruit. So, you know, these horrible stories, if you ever go to India or other places in the world, China or Japan, we have all that, the attached monkey stories where they just, you know, what monkeys are like, they're just why monkeys are so, I think, interesting for humans is they're just like us. They're just literally, you know, like Darwin would say, you know, you look into a mirror and see an ape. Our minds are very much like a monkey's mind. You know, they're very sweet. At the same time, can be really attached and mean or whatever. They're like little kids. And um, you see how much they suffer uh, because of their attachments and uh, their anxieties and those just like we do. 
And almost now with digital media and the way our world is now just so based on addiction and entertainment and the sort of um, always looking to uh, run away from our suffering through entertainment and diversion in an addictive way. Uh, we're more monkeys than, than we've ever been, I think, in our past. And my wife, Christine, always talks about the, in Africa, when they, that one area, I can't remember, they want to find uh, where water is. So, you, you know, the story, they have a little hole with a nut in a box and the monkey puts his hand in to get the nut, but he can't get his hand out as long as he's holding the nut. Like if he lets go of the nut, hand comes out of the box, the hole's just big enough for his hand, but a clenched fist, the hole's too small and he can't get out. Then they put salt in his mouth and then he finally lets go and he runs to, to get a glass of water, a drink of water, because he's so thirsty, then they follow the monkey to the water source and they have water for the village or whatever. But this whole idea that you, the monkey could be free if he just let go. If he let go of the little nut or the treat in the box, he wouldn't be stuck, his hand wouldn't be stuck in the box. Of course, sounds familiar, of course, because we're not far from being the same way as that monkey. So again, the monkeys represented here, going for the fruit, for something sweet. This produces the attachment uh, existence. And against that, the ripened karma in your mind that's ready to go or be sort of triggered by all the uh, karmic actions of attachment or aversion that you have. So that's usually represented here. Uh, this is a number which is also becoming or existence or chain uh, is uh, link number 10 usually shows a pregnant woman. So then 11 is her giving birth, which is birth. And then, uh, so yeah, so 10, 11, 12, final one being uh, well, old age and death. They usually, so uh, the, the pictures here is usually of someone, a dead person uh, being carried up to a cremation spot or whatever like that. Then of course, in other words, this is the whole ripened effect of samsara of true, you've got the true origins here. Now you get the true sufferings as the effect. And then what happens, ding, 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 you create samsara again, you, you die, you've got this complete attached mind going into the bardo or whatever, and you're grasping for your next life out of your ignorance, you get the ignorant mind again, and the cycle repeats just like the Ferris wheel or a pinwheel going around and around uh, the cycle of samsara. Those are the 12 related links. Now what in here is the six realms of existence that these links put you in. So you've got the God realm, there's, um, the demigod realm here, human realm, the hell's at the bottom, the hungry ghost realm, animal realm. And you see all this here, it's very cute here. The artist has done it where there's all hell beings coming up, being liberated and going into Amitabha's pure land. Like it looks like Amitabha, I think, of uh, Sukhavati or Dawachin or pure land of bliss. So they're being sort of liberated from uh, samsara and going up. But yeah, you, so in other words, you can end up in any of these six realms and you're constantly in and out like Ferris wheel. Uh, my first teacher, again, Kel St. Tarchin, would always say, uh, you're a human, you're on parole, right? Like you know, most of the time you're in the lower realms. So you've, you've got your get out of jail free or on parole for a day or a week or whatever. Then you're going to do something stupid and end up back in jail, right? Rob a 7-Eleven or something. Then, you know, you break your parole or you, you skip town and bleh, don't talk to your parole officer. You're back in jail. You're back in the lower realms, right? And then they have the three little... Um, there is, this is different. They usually, okay, the artists a little bit, but they'll, they'll hear, they usually have um, the three lower states of rebirth in black, and then the higher states of rebirth out of the six in white. So the higher ones being, of course, God realm, demigod realm, human realm in the white. And they usually show that, and it's kind of like, you know, rising and falling. So the, the lower states of rebirth, it's, ah, they're falling down. And then higher one, they're kind of on the, the wheel going up. Right, wheel going down, dropping the hell beings off, wheel going up, bringing the gods up. So the three white being uh, gods, demigods, and humans, and three black sort of the center being the um, uh, uh, hell beings, animals, and uh, hungry ghost beings. And then at the center is uh, the three animals, right? The famous animals representing the three root delusions we all have, which is ignorance, um, attachment, and anger. So this. They usually have them coming out of one another. So the um, uh, pig representing ignorance and out of his mouth comes the rooster attached uh, for representing attachment or like you could say like even like a rooster, like a pigeon. You see pigeons pecking around always looking, you know, for something to eat and kind of bugging you at the park. 
um, you know, or like a little monkey mind, and then uh, the snake being anger, and they sort of go in a little bit of a circle, but the primordial one out of all three of the root delusions, the main delusion, is everything arises out of ignorance, right? So there's a great quote by Nietzsche where he says, and people, I was remember in grad school, they didn't know what I was, he says, you know, um, what is it, pig, rooster, and snake, I am all of these, and I remember people in class like, what's that mean? I don't know, it's just like, well, it's the three, three animals representing the three root delusions of, um, of samsara so anyway that's your reflection so you have this at uh in temples they have you don't have it in the shrine room you have it close to the door so this is the equivalent um of a mirror by the door as you're going out to work or socialize you're going on your date you always check your you know whatever how's my hair whatever do i have you know do i have to blow my nose or like or whatever there's something is there lint on my 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 dress or whatever you take a look at the to take check yourself out as you go and but this mirror is a reminder for your day sam sarah you look in the mirror of sam sarah yep i want to be a pure dharma person and try and get out of jail so i'm on parole right now as a human dharma guy but i want out of jail forever by becoming an arhat or a buddha and so as i leave my house or when i come in from work i see yep still in samsara gotta keep trying you know so this is our little thing and who is the grim reaper or yama lord of death holding up the mirror right now the last thing is the beautiful thing this is kind of like the negative reflection but they usually have this is kind of they've got one little pure land here and then buddha here usually the ones i've seen they have buddha maybe in this corner here and he's pointing to a full moon and then at the bottom they have the verse uh in, in tibetan usually i guess but it's from sanskrit where which was i guess the original caption buddha gave as when he had this commission uh as a teaching and if i remember off the top of my head it is um yeah make an effort to destroy it enter yeah, enter into the Buddha Dharma. Destroy Yama, Lord of Death, just like an elephant destroys a grass hut. So um, the, the, the elephant, of course, is the bulldozer. So you could basically, you know, if you want a better metaphor, is uh, um, make an effort to destroy or kill Grim Reaper, uh, Lord of Hell, whatever. Um, enter into the Buddha Dharma. Make this your whole life the Dharma and destroy yeah my lord of death destroy samsara just like a bulldozer uh bulldozes a house or a wrecking ball knocks a house down or dynamite you could say like whatever big demolition blow big uh old apartment building up when you're clearing it uh, for a subdivision or something so that's the thing so what Buddha's is doing here is it's very sweet is he's pointing at the moon which represents the emptiness of the mind the the full moon is beautiful and clear and reflective like the conventional nature of the mind being clear and cognizing in other words it's you know, it doesn't have any quality or definition or form and it is luminous in the sense that it knows things appear as they are in the mind things are known so like a full moon but it also represents uh, the the base the emptiness of the mind itself so having a recognition of the nature of the mind that everything is the mind nature is clear and uh, luminous uh and ultimately that it you know it's changing it's just like a mirror it reflects things but that all things reflect the mind itself are empty so if they're empty anything is possible anything can change with the right karma hence the whole path of buddhism so that's what buddha is showing he's outside of samsara showing you how to get out this is this is jail you get out why by seeing ironically the moon here metaphorically is tied to the mirror itself the moon is a mirror the full moon just like yama lord of death so what's interesting is here's yama is the, ooh, the scary guy and the bad reflection here but if i can just see this as illusory or a reflection and see its emptiness the mirror is clear this is all dirt on the mirror that's wiped off. All this illusion ends up dissolving. So it's a very, very powerful and profound teaching just in, the, in a little card like this when you think about it, right? So it, yeah, who is the Grim Reaper? Who is the Yama? These are just monsters in your own mind, right? That's the old Tibetan folktale where they, you know, this guy's having a nightmare, this monster's chasing him, and, uh, and he's running in this in this maze, and finally he gets to a dead end, the monster's coming up, and he says, oh my god, I, I can't get out, and he goes, what am I supposed to do, I, what am I to do, and the monster says, well, you should know it's your dream, right, so 
what we're trying to do here is see that samsara is a dream that you don't see as a dream and you don't take it as a dream, which means you're stuck in it. But once you see its emptiness and see the emptiness of the mind and see how everything is karmically determined, ta-da, that is um, the teaching on the way out of liberating yourself from samsara. So just quickly, some of the notes here that I got down from the class is only about two pages is desire and rebirth. So this, it says the logic is to prove liberation, which is the 12 dependent related links. So in a lot of ways, when we study the 12 dependent related links, that is a way of proving uh, how to escape samsara, getting clear what samsara is and uh, knowing how to get rid of it. Ironically, like my teacher always said, any of these 12 related links, because they're causes and effects, you stop one of them in the series, the whole thing falls apart. So it's like a house of cards or that, what is it, Jumanji, or I can't, what's that little, anyway, the, with the little blocks and you stack them, you pull one out, the whole thing falls down. But the one that you pull, the easiest one to pull, of course, is the top one, the first one, which is ignorance by studying emptiness in the Dharma, right? Any of them will stop samsara. They're all interconnected. One presupposes the other, but you look for the weak link. You look for the weakest link. So the link that's the weakest is, of course, ignorance. We educate ourselves. By educating ourselves and practicing, you cut the weak link. The whole causal chain breaks down. The whole machine breaks down. So uh, the at mind, at the moment of death, a normal person's mind has a dire, uh, desire at the time of death, desire to persist, uh, the desire to continue. This creates or causes more of the same, in other words, your future life. So in other words, you can sort of see by having Grim Reaper here, it shows that the main problem is um, we're not just scared of suffering, but we're scared of dying. And we want to continue. We want our life to continue. We, want it. we don't want death or the ultimate annihilation of ourself to happen. Right, so that's why Grim Reaper is so scary, and why we were sort of motivated, even in Samsara, by fear. You can see that even attachment and suffering is the addiction we have um, to get away from pain. Pain itself and suffering reminds us of the ultimate pain and suffering of old age, sickness, and death. Right, so this sort of primordial desire, sort of consciousness, like coming out of compositional action, the monkey mind is rigged to be attached already, rigged to be addicted because it's based on fear. The ignorance here, uh, the fundamental ignorance of taking things to be truly existent and hence things will end, you yourself will end. That's sort of that death anxiety motivates the whole process. So um, yeah, uh, link number 10, I was saying that becoming or existence link here is the very right karma that can make you take rebirth right it's sort of started, it's the the existence or becoming was what creates the birth old age sickness and death and then the cycle repeats there okay so this is kind of like the trigger ready to go uh, karmically um yeah so what we need to sort of set that trigger off are like eight and nine which is craving and attachment here link 12 is old age and death if you avoid the triggers uh, eight and nine, you can avoid karma of ripening death. So what's interesting here, this is the whole tantric system, is we end up seeing that if this is actually, tantra means um, continuity, continuity of mind, everything being basis on mind. So if everything's, uh, Professor Robert Thurman said this, he said people call this, it's sort of a bad translation anyway of the Bardo Thodro, uh, liberation through hearing the Dharma in the Bardo, it's taken as the quote unquote Tibetan book of the dead based on the old translation theosophical people were had the Egyptian book of the dead, they find this Tibetan text, they call it the Tibetan book of the dead, even though that's not the name. But he was saying, ironically, the Tibetan book of the dead shows you there's no such thing as death. There's only life. There's no such thing as death. There's constant change and dying off, but with mind being the empty substratum or groundless ground of reality, even in samsara, mind always persists. So who dies? Well, you as the little sort of uh, constructed self ego dies, but technically your mind stream persists. And so that's what's interesting is who's scared of dying, right? Just the attached self that ends up going. Um, so what we can do, what's interesting is that if craving and attachment are the karmic triggers for existence, birth, old age, suffering, and death, these are causes. If you change the cause, 
you stop the effect or get a different effect. So what's interesting here is this is the, 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 the true causes as well as uh, true origins, I should say, as well as the true cessations. The true origins of samsara are the craving and attachment. That's what really triggers the samsara effects of true sufferings, right? But then there's the true cessations and the true paths. The true paths is let's the path of showing you how to get rid of craving and attachment. So if we can get rid of craving and attachment, we don't have the samsaric result uh, or effect of samsara, of old age, suffering, and death. So uh, Dharma Kuri says, desire in the mind at the uh, li uh, links eight and nine for, um, uh, for craving and attachment. Uh, at death in particular, this is what leads to the karma ripening or uh, the source of your mind in this life. So it's interesting is that the um, mind is the continuum going through all of this, but the worldly mind that's being pr projected forward, what they call sort of a throwing karma of you constantly putting yourself back into jail of samsara is based on the, the craving and attachment, creating the fear of death, creating this attachment, this, this addiction, this fear, always wanting to be happy, always being attached to things, never wanting uh, to be unhappy, never want to be separated from things, that craving uh, to get rid of your death anxiety, ironically, makes you die and makes you repeat the whole process of birth, old age, suffering and death and death anxiety going around in a circle, right? That's the, sort of the, the sad, twisted irony of samsara here. And so the John McCurdy was saying is this, I mean, ironically, the continuity of mind here, uh, it's this deluded mind that's causing the problem. But technically, if we have an understanding, the continuity of mind, if we, we change the karma here, this will allow us to get rid of death entirely and to find full enlightenment as an immortal Buddha. Death is just a karmic result or a perception, a virtual creation. So if I, that's the result of the craving Sam Sir, this biological death is the result of the craving and attachment. But if we get rid of those causes, we no longer have that as a result. That's the deathlessness we talked about in, in Tantra, right? Uh, so, which is interesting is uh, link eight is based on link seven, the ability to feel, uh, the feeling is the desire not to be separated from the object. So it's interesting, just like the contact and the feeling here, you know, the sex and the arrow here, this intimacy or cra that creates the craving or addiction is not wanting to be separated from things. But ironically, you know, what's funny here is again, another one of these sad, cruel ironies, we're always already interrelated things because things are empty. So we're never separated from things. We never gain or lose anything in samsara, ironically, right? Because everything's interrelated through emptiness. But because we're attached to this self-existence, the faulty, impossible way of conceiving things, it seems that we're losing things in our mind. It seems that we're losing things, that we have everything to lose. So we have to jealously guard it for ourselves and keep it at all cost with the attached addictive mind, which again, triggers the existence um, uh, link and then creates the samsaric results here. Um, yes, being attached to not losing uh, nice feelings, uh, the sort of addiction to pleasure and happiness and worldly things in our life, not to be separated from these. This is what activates the karma. So we have to get rid of this, then we won't be reborn in samsara, but rather we'll be outside following the full moon of Buddha Shakyamuni and become an arhat. So basically what is this craving deep down is a craving for self or me, the me that we uh, are scared of losing in death the whole sort of movie that we're attached to of ourselves with all our likes and dislikes and happiness and everything else in this world. So basically it's a craving for existence. The ex I mean, ironically, the craving here of the couple making love creates the pregnant lady over here, right? The contact we have with the world creates the pregnant existence that produces samsara here. So basically, just you know, like a lot of what Islamists would say, almost on an existentialist level, the issue is the creation of the self out of death anxiety, the attachment we have to a self-existent, truly existent self, which is of course fictional and doesn't exist here. That's the problem. So it's the craving of self is the actual trigger to all of this. So how do we get rid of the craving for the self? 
Well, we get rid of the wrong view of self, right? The ignorance, the, the idea that things are existing outside of relationships to anything else. We're seeing here through these things that because of contact, name and form, or even compositional factors or karma, that everything is related or in a relationship to one another. Th that, you know, through um, contact here and in, in even the six sources, that mind's intentional. That mind always has objects that we're always interpenetrating with the world. And yet our mind believes that everything is unrelated and separate, most of all me. So this is the wrong view that creates samsara. This is the ignorance that is the source of all the problems, is the wrong view of the self. So to stop the process of rebirth, the innate grasp that we all have to see ourselves as self-existence, get rid of this desire that, that uh, crosses over from lifetime to lifetime, grasping at the self-existent me. So um, it's not just dying without grasping, but dying without seeing the self as self-existent. So again, that's the big problem of the old age sickness and death and dying is it's not the question of we're just dying with attachment and a delusion mind. We're starting the process again and again and again because we're dying with that ignorant view of grasping at inherent existence this first mind of ignorance the blind guy is being projected all along through the whole ring of 12 dependent related links so again that's the target right here if we have target practice an arrow or a gun this is the the clay duck or whatever we throw in the air and shoot it with the rifle or whatever, or you know, in the fair that you you know hit the little rubber ducky over or something. That's the, the ignorance link, is that so the key trigger desire that self-existent me has to be happy and not stop. So it has to persist and not die. So this ends up causes us to act in ways that won't make us happy, or in other words, craving, attachment, bad actions, bad karma. So again, what so how, just concluding here, how do we um, tie this to valid cognition? What's the take home? Again, like Buddha, they usually have the little saying down here, uh, make an effort to destroy it. Enter into the Buddha Dharma, destroy the Lord of Death as an elephant destroys a grass hut. In other words, the, the true valid cognition that we have to manifest here is the valid cognition of wisdom realizing emptiness and the three higher trainings observing karma, be a good person, have a disciplined moral mind, train in concentration, meditate, that we take that concentrated meditative mind and meditate on emptiness, the non-inherent uh, nature of all existence or the related quality of all things. And that's the ultimate um, medicine or the if this is all a dirty mirror, this is the Windex we use in the paper towel. We 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 we. And this is nice and shining like the full moon in the corner here. And we reach enlightenment. All of our true sufferings, the Grim Reaper, Lord of Death, is destroyed for good. So there we go. That's um, that's the class there on uh, Pramana and the Wheel of Life. What is the Wheel of Life? So let's just take a moment to uh, dedicate here and uh, all of our good merit and uh, that we've uh, studied here together and practiced together here today, may it be put towards, again, realizing the new true teachings of this uh, wheel of life and in particular emptiness. So by the blessings of all holy beings, the truth of karma, the power of pure spirit intention, and all the Dharma wishes be fulfilled. Okay, thank you for coming.